and okay so I think I'm recording now yep. um let's go ahead and pray thank you father for your word and thank you Lord that you are sufficient when we are insufficient you are capable when we are incapable you are so patient with us in the midst of our distractions in the midst of our struggles in the midst of our frailties in our sickness you are the sufficient one I thank you Father um, and I just pray that you would take over right now Lord that you would um, fill me with your spirit that your words would come forth that um, anything that is of me or my thought would fall to the ground but that your word would stand forever that it would perform <clears throat> that which you have sent it forth to do and Lord I just pray that your you would send your heavenly host to protect this time that there would be no confusion no um, no cloud of uh, distraction that would be allowed to be hindering this message, Lord. In Jesus' name, I rebuke you, anything that would keep us from hearing the pure word of God. Well, Father, I pray that you would stir up. We know it's by your spirit that we are convicted of sin. It's by your spirit we can know who Jesus is. It's by your spirit that we can have a greater revelation of who you are. So, Lord, I just pray that you would send your spirit to everybody who's listening right now to open up the eyes of the blind and the ears that are stopped up, that you would unstop them, that you would heal our hearts, and, and stir up within us a desire and a passion for you that would not just fizzle out, but that would continue to grow brightly. Lord, put a desire in your people to become everything that you intended them to be. Lord, that we would find our completion and our satisfaction in you, in you alone. In your name we ask it, Jesus. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> so this is the last of a series that we've been calling the SEAL, the SEAL training. And it's um, from <clears throat> the opening of the SEALs in Revelation. And this all started in Revelation 5 when John sees um, the Holy One seated on his throne and, <coughs> and he sees a scroll that's written on the inside and the out and there's seven seals on it and nobody is available to open up that scroll. And John is terribly distressed about this to the point where he weeps bitterly saying, who is it that will be worthy to open up the scroll? And one of the elders that had been worshiping before the throne of God says to John, stop crying, look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. And then in uh, chapter 5, the elders sing a song and they the song that they sing this is a new song um, that they sing is this and I have it here you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you the Lamb of God were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation and you made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. And this song that they're singing is <clears throat> the light in which we look at the, the scrolls. This is what God intended uh, in this 
revealing, the progressive revealing of the contents of the scroll. One, Jesus was worthy to open it because he had already made a way of salvation for his people by his death, which paid the price of the sins of all those in the world. Anyone who would believe on him, they could be saved by putting their faith and trust in him. And in, their res in his resurrection, he made it possible for them to return to an Edenic state where they could commune with God unhindered again. And we've often turned back to that prophecy in Ezekiel 36:26, where he says that he will give a new spirit to the people who will believe in him and that new spirit will be capable of talking to God. It won't be cut off or dead to him any longer. In fact, not only would he give a new spirit, but he would put his Holy Spirit inside that person, which is why we say it's grace upon grace. It is life in abundance because now it's not just you being, you know, back into sort of ground zero, but you actually having God's Holy Spirit as a living presence within you. And so we have the super abundance that is available to us. And the goal was this, not just to save people or just to redeem people, but to bring a multitude of people, not just the Jewish people, but from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So it's going to be an extended group. And they will be a kingdom that will be his, and they will be priests to our God. So they're going to have a specific job rightly being re rightly related to them and ministering to others. And they are going to reign. So these are not just priests, but priests who reign. So it's, it's a marrying of both the uh, religious aspect and the civic aspect, if you will. A kingdom of priests that are going to reign on the earth. This is what he's looking at as he begins to unfold or undo these seals. But as we begin to look at what the seals are, we recognize that the seals, um, it's not the way we would normally establish. Um, they seem sort of destructive. So just real quick as a reminder, the first seal is uh, found in Revelation 6. It deals with the lamb coming out. Uh, we see a first horseman. He's a conqueror. He's going to conquer. He has conquered and he will conquer. And that we talked about how it is the, the reigning victorious Christ who is going to not only conquer sin and death, but he's also going to conquer our hearts so that they will be completely devoted to him. Anyone who's been a Christian for any period of time knows that there is the sin and the death on the outside, but then there's the internal stuff that it seems to always be at war within us. And Jesus is vying for our affections so that we are completely 100% his. The second horse, the red fiery horse comes out and there's the sword and it, it brings enmity between one group of people and another. And we talked about how Jesus said, he told us that our families would be divided because of him. Our friendships would be divided because of him. There would be an enmity between those who would follow Christ and those who don't. And it has to be that way. And what is established at that point is loyalty. Are you going to be loyal to the kingdom of this earth? Or are you going to be loyal to Christ and his kingdom? And you have to choose which side you're going to serve on. The third horse brought us, uh, it was a black horse, and um, it was uh, the one with scales in his hand. There was a horseman had scales in his hand. And uh, one of the living creatures said that a quart of wheat would be for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, but don't harm the olive oil or the wine. And so you see here a, a famine type situation where you would work all day and you'd get just enough. And this is the point where you learn to trust in God for your provision. 
you you don't have a super abundance. You don't have the storehouses. You don't have the maybe the 401k waiting there or the physical resources that you think you need to get through the day. Instead, you're requiring uh, you're being required to become dependent on the Lord. In the same way that Abraham had to follow the Lord wherever he told him to go. He said, I'm going to leave all the things that you have, your home, your comfort, your, your family, and go out to the land I'll show you. He didn't know where he was going to go. He was dependent on his Lord for instruction. And in the same way, we are called to leave and be dependent. And in that, we learn to trust. We learn that God is truly a faithful provider. And so what's happening with each one of these seals that are opened in our life as we submit to the Lord is that he's bringing us into a deeper and deeper relational walk with him. And from the earth perspective, it looks like loss. But from heaven's perspective, it's all gain. Because you're gaining relationship. You can't hold on to the things of the world and gain the things of God at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> the fourth seal is the seal that brings about death. This was such an odd seal because it unleashed a, a horseman on a green horse. And we talked about how a lot of times they called it a sickly horse or a, a pale green horse, but actually the word was just green, like the same green you would use for grass or trees or whatever. And, and I think the symbolism is this, that while death and death's domain were riding on this horse, it was a death that brought life. And, and that's the same way resurrection is. Jesus died, and then he rose again. His death brought life. And in his true followers, we are told that we will be crucified with Christ, but we will be raised to life again. And so we walk that same pattern. Um... Death could occur in a lot of different ways. It could be a loss of something. It could be um, <clears throat> physical health or sickness or, or a dream that's gone away or, or whatever. But those deaths in our life, those dark places in our life, uh, Neil Anderson, he calls them the ministry of darkness in our life, are necessary so that we can have something new come out of that death. When we were in Orlando and we were losing our house and um, we knew that the Lord was taking us into a place of a wilderness time period and he asked us, are you going to trust us? I remember a sweet lady came up to me and she said to me with these eyes, they were just so intense, she said, Leanne, sometimes you have to let go of what's in your hand so that it will be empty to receive the blessing of God. And I, I never forgot that because it was a death to us. I was so happy to have a house with a yard for my children. And, and to let go of that was hard. It was painful. And yet, the Lord has filled our hands. Now, years later, I have a house for my children in 10 acres instead of a quarter of an acre. He has certainly filled our hands with something new that he wanted to give to us. But we couldn't have had it if we had held tightly on to that which he was asking from us. So a death that brings life. Then we had the fifth seal, which revealed the saints who were under the throne of God, who had gone through this, this death, and they were crying out for justice, and, and God told them, here, have a white robe. They were handed the robe at that time. And then he said, wait a little longer because there's more of your number that are going to be gathered to you. And just be patient. And so we begin to see what God had started here with <coughs> the desire for kingdom of priests after these, these four horsemen come along, ending in death. Now we see the making of a saint who is under the throne of God. And we talked about how we're dealing with two different dimensions here. There's a physical dimension that we all are very aware of, flesh and blood and, and things that we can walk around and touch. But there's a spiritual dimension that's in the heavenly places, at, and we live at both, in both, at the same time. 
You know, we're told that we are presently seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Well, right now, I'm standing in Little Falls, or just outside of Little Falls, Minnesota. But I'm also presently, right now, in reality, in a different dimension, seated with Christ, positionally. Now, I have to believe that second place by faith, because I can't see it with my flesh eyes, and I can't touch it with my flesh hands. I can't hear the angels singing praises to God, but the Bible says they are, and I believe it by faith that that is actually happening right now and positionally I'm standing or sitting with my Jesus. And we must learn to let the reality of the heavenly realm rule in our hearts and minds as opposed to the physical realm that we live in. Because it's the spiritual realm that is actually more real. So we see the fifth deal. And then we get to the sixth seal, and we talked about the sixth seal, <clears throat> and we're going to recap that and look at it a couple different ways before we finish up with the seventh seal. So um, the recap, I have it sort of laid out here, Revelation 6, 12 through 14. A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's hair. And the entire moon became like blood. The stars of the heavens fell to the earth as a fig tree dropping its unripe figs when shaken by high wind. The sky separated like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Now this is the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And this, this is talked about in the prophet Haggai has a prophecy where he talks about how he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. It talks about shaking of the heavens and earth all throughout the Pauline epistle. Um, there's the shaking of the heaven and earth. Jesus mentions it. The shaking of the heavens and the earth. What's that all about? <coughs> well, in the very least, it deals with all that we find to be safe and secure. There's probably nothing more secure than the sun rising and setting every day. And the stars showing up and being, we, I mean, we navigate by the stars. The moon phases. People for years and years and years have set their calendars by the moon and its phases. We, we count our days for the year by the rising and setting of the sun. It, it is our constant in life. And yet God says, I'm going to shake it. Mm. The very thing that you put... You, you find to be the most consistent thing in life. That's going to be shaken. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, what you can see. I mean, this is full of metaphors. Revelation is full of metaphors and, and symbols. Uh, Things that you see, you, you, you can no longer see because the sun, the very light that warms the earth, that gives us understanding of what's going on, is going to be dark. And the moon... There's man, there's so much there. Um, it returns to blood. It, 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 it can't reflect the sun any longer, or the sun's light. It's got guilt on it, if you will. It's almost in the, in the same view. I mean, we, Israel was supposed to reflect the light of, of God. And if you remember when Jesus was brought up on trial, what did the people say? They said, let his blood be on what? Us. Us and our children. And our children. Yeah. Instead of, and, and that was a good thing, they didn't realize what they were saying. Because if, if you are covered in the blood, if you are washed in the blood, then you can be saved. But they were talking about it in a guilt kind of way. And, you know, the, you could also look at the moon. The moon is oftentimes a, a picture of all the other deities. They almost always had a moon god of some sort. Um, covered in blood. Guilty. The stars Amen. fell out of the heavens. The scroll is wrapped up. It's like everything is being undone. Every bit of wisdom, every messenger, the angels are oftentimes related to those stars as messengers. If you look at Jude, you'll see that picture. 
Um, and so, you know, everything and every bit of wisdom that we could gain has been shaken. Our understanding of how things run is shaken. And you can see the response of the people in 15 to 17. The kings of the earth, the nobles, the military commanders, the rich, the powerful, the slaves, everyone. They go and, and hide in the caves. This is sort of like Adam and Eve hiding in the trees when they hear God coming through to talk to them. We're all going back sort of to that Eden picture when there was sin that was exposed. Here you have everyone. It doesn't matter how, whether you were great or of no account. They all, the, level, the playing field was leveled. They said, fall and hide on us to the rocks and the mountains from the face of the one who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb because the day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand. So we see them there. Security is shaken. Everything that they've done in life is shaken. Their significance is gone and they're left with fear. Um, we talked also about how mountains and islands are the mountains are the picture of all the structures that we have built, our kingdoms that we've built. They're all crumpled. In fact, they're begging those mountains to fall on them so that they can be hidden. Not so they could die, but so they could be hidden. There's a sense that like they couldn't die. But they were fearful of the judgment to come. So then in 7, 1 through 3, we, there's a shift of scene. And this is still part of Seal 6. Um, but he says that he sees four angels standing there. This is John talking. I see four angels at the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds. Whenever you see the four, you're dealing with the things of nature, the things of this earth. Four corners, four winds, four angels, four creatures who are before the throne of God with the different faces. It's all dealing with the natural realm that God has created. And the angels are told to not harm the earth. There's destruction coming until all those who are to be sealed are sealed. And so there's a restraint from the coming destruction. I just want to point out the chaos that we see as chaos is not chaos to God. He has a heavenly restraint. And he can only he only allows things to go so far. He will not allow those who are anointed or sealed to be touched, except for however much he has divinely allowed for their good, not for their harm. And so he goes about sealing those, and we're going to come back to those seals, but they are sealed on, on the forehead before the earth is going to suffer destruction. And, and I'm sort of of the opinion that this is actually happening at the same time as the shaking of the heavens and earth is. You know, it's like he talked about it here on the earth, here's the earth realm, and then let's shift and look at what's happening in the heavenly realm. And so these two things are happening concurrently from the earth side and from the heavenly side, if you will. Then you have um, a view from um, 9 through 10 of chapter 7 where he says, uh, John says, I looked and I saw a vast multitude of every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were robed in white with palm branches in their hands. Now this should bring back the image of Jesus coming into Jerusalem just before his crucifixion, where people on earth, they had lined the streets with their coats, they had palm branches in their hands, and they were hailing him as king. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying, he's victorious, he's coming in. And they were waving these palm branches. Of course, they were looking with earthly eyes for an earthly king who was going to overthrow the Romans. And when that didn't happen, they just dethroned him. But uh, in the earthly realm. And... Uh, here we see a heavenly representation of the same thing, except the victory is understood according to spiritual things. Look, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He has created for himself a kingdom of priests who are reigning of every tribe and tongue and nation. He did exactly what he set out to do in chapter 5. 
And, um, and so we know we're drawing to the close here. They cry out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. These people are standing as witnesses to the rest of mankind, I believe, while they are positionally in heaven. This is what they're saying. But they are saints who have gone through this period of, of, of testing, seal after seal after seal after seal, of loss and of, of needing to learn God's provision and of uh, learning loyalty to the Lord and trusting Him. They've gone through that process and now they are complete. And when we see them again in um, the making and benefit of a saint, that's 13 through 17 there, you see them as the, the ones robed in white. In seal 5, they were just handed that robe. Here, they're wearing it. Here, they are established in their sainthood, as it were. And um, John is asked by the elders, who are these? And where did they come from? And John has the great answer, you know. And so the elder speaks to them and he tells them, he says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And then he goes on to say, for this reason... They are before the throne of God and they serve Him day and night in His sanctuary. This is the expansion of the uh, little hymn of praise um, that was spoken before about this kingdom of priests who would be before God. These saints are doing, they are fulfilling their role that, that Jesus had set about to conquer their hearts so that they would be fully devoted to him. They they had taken the robe and they had been washed clean in his blood and now they stand day and night making intercession with the Lord. And it's such an incredible thing because in that intercession they are actually participating in the work of Christ. <coughs> Because Christ stands ever making intercession for us. And we're going to see a little clearer picture of that in just a few minutes. <coughs> they are doing exactly what he had intended to do, them to do. And here's what they're characterized by. They're going to be sheltered by the one seated on the throne. They no longer hunger and thirst. The sun can't strike them any longer with any heat. And the Lamb who is at the center of the throne is going to shepherd them. He'll guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And people oftentimes put this as sort of the end of the age. But if we recognize that we are in two different dimensions here, it's not just for the end of the age and we just have to suffer until we get there. This is for now. This is what he will presently do when he's really Lord of your heart, when he's at the center of the throne in your, in your soul, in your spirit. When he is reigning King and Lord, then he will or shelter you. You will not hunger or thirst for righteousness. He will provide for every need that you have. He will bring you to springs of living water. You will be satisfied in your soul and in him. He will shepherd you and guide you. We are told that he will tell you, this is the way, walk in it, and you will know which way to go. You will hear his voice and be certain that you're hearing him. And this is what happens. This is the benefit of being one with Christ. This is what we should be going forward to. This, I hope this becomes everyone's... Uh, desire is, Lord, take me to that place where I'm 100% yours, and you are in me, and I am in you, and we are truly married. Because that was the goal in the beginning. He wanted a bride, a full bride, who would live and love and laugh and cry and feel 
and share in the sufferings that he had and build a family with him. That's what he wanted. It's the picture of the bridegroom and the bride. So then we get to the seventh seal. Um, hang on. I think there was a few other things. Oh, I sort of talked about this. This is another way to look at this is... Um, <clears throat> No, oh, you're missing it. It's God's redemption plan. Uh, this is just, we've talked yeah, about this not way, way from the beginning. Um, in Genesis 1, 24 through 28, and then in verse 31, we see the, the uh, creation of man. God's going to create man in his image to be with him. And... <coughs> The, the goal was communion. And it would be a willing communion. It wouldn't be a forced communion. Um, and so he wanted man to choose him, mankind to choose him, to love him, and to respond to his love. And when God created mankind, he created him to have um, acceptance. He, he had favor with God. God said he was good and very good. His creation was very good. He gave him security in the Garden of Eden. Their every need was provided for. He had significance in that he was given rulership over the earth. <clears throat> but man wanted to do things outside of the ways of God. And that's been the temptation right from the very beginning, is to do things your own way. When Adam and Eve fell, that was really the choice there. So I'm going to to choose to do wisdom, to gain wisdom my own way. Instead of just walking with God and gaining wisdom, I'm going to shortcut or short cycle the whole thing by getting it this, this easier way, taking the fruit. So they did that, and this is the end in Revelation 6 of that choice. This is the fruit of it. You have your loss of security. The foundations are all shaken. Everything that you've created and built is crumbled. You um, have a loss of acceptance because now you see man cowering, fearing the wrath of God instead of having perfect communion with God. And then uh, your loss of systems means that, you know, it, it, if you were a king, you were now, you know, just as good off as a slave. And um, and so there was no significance. No, you couldn't do anything to help yourself. You couldn't rule anyone or anything. Um, you're doing nothing of worth except for hiding. And that is um, that was the end of man's way. But the redeemed, their way, led to um, salvation from God, which means that they were reaccepted. In in the parentheses, those are the verses. But they were accepted because of their salvation. Would you please stop? Um, and then they gained security in God. And this is from that section from the saints. Um, they were, or sheltered, their needs, their physical needs of um, hunger and thirst were satisfied. The heat wouldn't come against them. Um, and then they also uh, were given a significance because in their growth and maturity, they were able to come and to worship before the Lord and minister to Him. They Actually, they were um, no longer just ruling over the physical realm any longer. They were ruling in a spiritual place. So they were increased in their significance, if you will, because of their spiritual growth. So then... Um, <clears throat> If we look at the men, the state of earth men versus heaven's men. And once again, these are just sort of comparisons. Um, the earth men, they see a destruction of everything that they've touched. Their ability to hold things together, their social structures, their institutions, everything that they find reliable is gone and they're just left with fear. Whereas heaven's men, they appropriate the blood of the Lamb. It's not what they're doing. 
See, the Earthmen are all about what they do or have done or could do in their own strength and might. But Heaven's men are reliant and dependent on, on God Himself through Christ. And so in appropriating the blood of the Lamb through faith, they become strong and victorious. They are given a calling of a priest. Their inheritance yeah. is God yeah. himself. They are able to return back to Eden, which everybody has been trying to do, knowingly or unknowingly. We've all been trying to get back to a place of security and significance and acceptance in, through different ways. And these heavens men actually do it. And they are in perfect communion with God. So the way the uh, four, twelve thousand of each tribe that are si uh, sealed, these guys are telling a story. This is not a typical listing of the tribes. Like if you were to go back in the Torah and look where they listed out the tribes, um, they always put them in in sort of the flow of when they were born, you know, or when Jacob started to bless those who would inherit when Moses is blessing the different tribes at the end of Deuteronomy and, and saying how God would, inter, you know, prophesying over them and how their tribe would inherit different things from the Lord. It's always based off of the uh, verse order. But this is not. This is the way it's listed. And he starts with, um, with Judah here. And it tells a little bit of a story. Um, one other note is this is like... The twelve tribes, but it's magnified. So this is this is a huge number, 144,000. But it's a representative number. It's the the twelve tribes magnified. That's the message there. Um, Judah means let him be praised in the Greek. In the Hebrew, Judah or Judah, um, Yehuda is praised. But in the Greek, it's let him be praised. And um, this is the beginning of the story of us when we are rightly related to God and we, we begin to grow in the Lord. Our, the first thing off of our mouth as an infant or babe in the Lord is praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it's like God says back to us what Reuben's name is. Behold, a son. That's what, that's what his name meant. And I think this is interesting because when we're just babies in the Lord, we don't look like much. In fact, we might still have a lot of mess in us. And yet God looks up and he sees us as the end product. And he says, behold, a son. This is going to be my son who will rule and reign with me. Then we see Gad. Well, Gad was the troop. And it was they were a great warring tribe. <clears throat> and I think this points to all of the external things that the Lord seems to tackle first. And, and in the maturing of a believer, oftentimes it's the external things that he starts to convict us of. Um, that, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> whatever. And he begins to work on those things. And this leads us into a place of blessing and happiness, Asher. So, you know, as you begin to walk in the Lord's ways, you experience blessing. And that, that's the Torah. It says, if you follow my commandments, then you'll be blessed. And if you don't, you'll be cursed. This is just the way that God set up the spiritual laws. Naphtali is, means wrestling. And we see this with Jacob. When he is coming back, he's left Laban and he's heading back towards his homeland, and the angel of the Lord meets him. He knows that Esau is coming up against him, and he's scared to death. He's separated his family out, and, and he turns in the nighttime. He's just praying to the Lord, and the angel of the Lord shows up, and he ends up wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And they wrestle and wrestle and wrestle and wrestle and wrestle until daybreak happens, and finally... Um, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And this is that internal wrestling. Like, I know there's more of you, Lord. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. There's already a relationship going on here 
with this person. But there's this, this crisis that happens in many, many believers' lives. If you haven't experienced it, ask for it. If I want to go to the next level, what I have is not enough. It's not enough for me to be moral. I need you to take me into intimacy with you. Wrestling cannot be done six feet away. Wrestling has to be done hand to hand, eye to eye, body to body. And that's what we're seeing here. Then we have <coughs> Manasseh. Manasseh was actually a son of Joseph. It was not a son of Jacob. And if you remember, Joseph, when he was restored to his father, his father Jacob said, I'm going to take your two children, Manasseh and Ephraim, and I'm going to treat them as if they are mine. And so, in a way, he was giving Joseph a double portion because he took those grandchildren, uh, what would have been his grandchildren, and made them like his children. So Manasseh was one of those, and his name meant forgetting what lies behind. And this, oh man, that reminds me of Paul. He says, this one thing I do, I forget what was behind and I press on to the forward, forward to the heavenly goal that is set before me. And this is what all children, uh, children of the Lord who are maturing do. They say, I don't care. I'm leaving the world behind. My gaze is forward. I'm heading to the heavenly places and nobody is going to stop me. And that's really, this is now where we're really into the seal. This, this um, unveiling in us through this process is, is to let go of the earth thing. To let the Lord shuck that off. So that we can reach into the heavenlies and live there with our minds firmly, firmly fixed on the Lord. Simeon is a hearkening. It means to hear. And I, it could be me, meant either hearkening or heard, depending on whether you're looking at it from a Greek perspective or from the Hebrew. And I think both of them work. In one sense, we hear God's voice and respond to it. In another sense, God hears our voice and responds to it. And there's this, now this relationship, this communion that happens where um, we can pray to the Lord and know that he will do. He will respond to us. And not only that, but when he speaks to us, we know his voice. This kind of intimacy is a real privilege. But it only happens when we are unhindered, when we don't have other voices in our head or things that are distracting us. This leads us to being attached to the Lord. And that's what Levi means. Is our heart is knitted with Him because we're hearing Him and responding to Him. And the more we do that, the deeper our relationship grows. Issachar is uh, wages. And we are told that as we labor with the Lord, that He will look, Isaiah, no. He will look at what we have done and He will make a judgment on it. And for those who have worked with him in his fields, it's rubies and, and gold and silver that we are, we are storing up heavenly treasures. I mean, we certainly don't work for our salvation, but this person is way past the beginning stages of salvation. They have grown in maturity to where they are laboring along with their, their loved one, with their king in his field. And he's saying, what you are doing is of value, and it's eternally significant. You know, the, I love Leonard Ravenhill. He makes the comment. He says the most valuable thing that we will handle is the human soul. And so as we labor for souls, the building up of souls and maturity, or introducing people to Christ, as we are laboring for those souls, he sees that and he says, ah, you will have treasures in heaven. Zebulun is habitation, our dwelling places with the Lord. And his dwelling place is with us. We're in the season of Sukkot. This is the time when we remember that God saved us so that he could be with us, so that he could be in us. And he would never leave or forsake us, not even until the end of the age. Joseph is, he will add. 
And that's what his goal is, is to add more and more to his kingdom. As we are one in vision with the Lord, we will work for those purposes to continue to add to the family of God, to continue to build the kingdom of God. Because it's a glorious kingdom. It is way better than the kingdom of this earth. And Benjamin, the last one in the list, is the fulfillment of what God saw. Behold a son. You have become a son of my right hand. And the right is always the place of power and strength. And so when he says you are a son that's ruling after me with proper power and proper strength, you are indispensable to me is what he says. What a high place for the king to say about us. It's Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father. And since we are in Him, in a sense, we are sitting there too at the right hand of the Father. What an incredible thought of the intimacy that God is inviting us into if we would go through that process. There are some who are unlisted, however. Ephraim is not on the list. That was the brother of Manasseh. And Dan, who was one of the... <clears throat> one of the um, sons of Jacob was not on the list. And both of these were known for their idolatry. Um, Ephraim, was his name means fruitful, and he certainly was fruitful in the earthly realm. He had lots of material possessions and status. He became known as when the um, Israel sometimes is used synonymously with Ephraim when the Israel was split into two pieces and Judah uh, was the one side and Ephraim or Israel the other side. They were idolatrous. They decided that to worship God in their own way and eventually just stopped worshiping them all together and were scattered exiled. And and so Ephraim doesn't make this list. Because if you have idolatry in your heart, or adultery in your heart, spiritual adultery, you cannot be experiencing the blessings of God. It doesn't matter how blessed you look from the earthly realm. You cannot receive the heavenly blessings of God if you have a mixture in your heart. And Dan, he is the one that was judged. That's what his name meant. It's judged. And once again, he was uh, full of idolatry. And God's judgment was that he would not inherit the heavenly blessing because of that. So those two didn't make the list. I want to look real quick at a parallel passage, and this is Romans 8. Which also gives us a picture of the maturing of the saints. You know, Romans 6, 7, and 8 um, really describe the salvation process for us. Um, how the law functions in our life. And how we learn to live according to the new law, the law of the Spirit. And um, this Romans 8 is, is talking about walking by in, in the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. Um the people who are, are beginning to recognize this and, and to appropriate this, they're already understanding that, that there is a salvation for them by Jesus' blood. And um, in Romans 8, 1 through 11, he really talks about this. He goes over it again, Paul does. He says, There is no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined, in life union with Jesus, the Anointed One. For the law of the Spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God accomplished what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. So there is no condemnation for us and we have to speak that out or appropriate that. We have to, because Satan will still try to tell us that we're condemned and to get us to live a lie. 
But we, when we say no, I'm living in Christ. I'm not any more guilty before him. I am a saint who sins. I'm not a sinner who is constrained to sinning. I'm a saint in God's view. Then, as we speak that out, as we appropriate Christ's blood and we speak that out, then we are recognizing our identity. And Romans 12, or, sorry, 8, 12 through 17 deals with that identity. We're God's children. We're co-heirs with Christ. We're seated in the heavenly places with him. Um, and since we are his true children, we qualify to share his treasures. Indeed, we are heirs of God himself, and since we are joined with Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided we accept his sufferings or his feelings of labor pains, of love for people as our own. As we are united in heart with him, this goes right along with that progression that we saw in Revelation of the, the feeling. Um... As we are united with his heart and experience his suffering from his anguish, we also experience his glorification. We experience his resurrection life. In Romans 18 to 25, our view changes and we see a heavenly view. Um, not sure how to make it go forward. make it go for. There you go. Uh, so the heavenly view, I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. I think it's interesting that he says that it, it's, it's a magnitude of glory that's about to be unveiled within us. Because where is the kingdom of heaven? It's within you. We tend to think of it as being somewhere in the sky, past the heavens, you know, and the stars and all that. But it's not. It's within us. When Christ is seated on the throne of our heart, and he's reigning there, he is in his kingdom reign. And his glory should be shining through us, emanating from us. In verses 26 and 27, we begin the participation in the work of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And that brings us significance. It says, uh, in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. At times, we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. God, the searcher of our heart, knows fully our longings. Yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. And so we see the Holy Spirit within us, leading and guiding us and praying through us. And then we're going to see in just a second the picture of us being in the heavenly places in that other dimension with Christ who is offering up our prayers, collecting them and offering them up and offering them before the Lord. And that affects things here on earth. And so we're praying, the Holy Spirit is praying, Jesus is praying and interceding for us. And, and then the Father is judging and, and making things happen in our earthly realm as we are working with him. Just as Adam worked with God in the Garden of Eden, as God would bring him animals and say, here, you're going to take dominion over these animals. Name this animal. Name that animal. And Adam worked with God in communion, taking dominion over this earthly realm. Now, we, on the other side, as Revelation the book ends to Genesis, so on the other side, now we are taking dominion with Christ here on earth through our intercessory prayer. No wonder Satan tries to stop our prayer. He tries to get us busy or distracted or, or tired or whatever so that we don't pray because he knows when we sit there and we're in intercession, we are participating in the dominion taking of Christ himself as a co-heir with Christ. And he's trying to stop that union. 
He doesn't mind stopping it by just getting us busy in good stuff outside of participating in, in the intercession and the prayer closet. <clears throat> in verse 28 through 30, we are convinced that every detail of our life is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan, bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. For he knew all about us before we were even born. He destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of a son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. We are secure in him. Our place is secure. And no one can take us from the hand of the father. In verses 31 to 39, we see a victory no matter what we lose. He goes on to, uh, Paul talks about how <clears throat> God has given us Jesus, his, his greatest treasure. How much more will he give us everything? He offered him up as a sacrifice. He wouldn't withhold us anything that we need. And he's certainly not going to uh, um, withhold love from us. And he, and he goes to this great big hymn <coughs> about what could separate us from the love of Christ. And death, or nakedness, or sword, or famine, or, or whatever. Nothing could separate us from the love of Christ. And, and so we are so completely certain that we will be victorious because Christ was victorious. And if Christ be in us and for us, then who can be against us? The victory is sure. So, that brings us all the way through the six seals into the final seal, the seventh seal. And as per normal in Hebraic guide, um, every cycle leads to another cycle. So, you have to think of it in terms of circles. So as you get to the end of one circle, you're beginning a new circle. And that's what's happening here. The goal is realized. We have now become sons and daughters of God, and they have been revealed to the earth. When the Lamb opens the seventh seal in chapter 8 of Revelation, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. There's no time in heaven. But the sense is a short time. Everybody just stops and is in awe. In the same way that when God created the heavens and the earth and he finished his work, the seventh day he rested. He just stopped. And he looked back over his work and he said, it is very good. And then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God and uh, seven trumpets were given to them. So this is the setup for the next cycle that's going to be happening in Revelation. The cycle of the trumpets. And um, these angels are getting ready to blow those. And then another angel with a golden incense burner, which is the uh, object of the priest, came and stood at the altar, the altar of incense, and he was given a large amount of incense to offer along with the prayers of all the saints on the gold altar in front of the throne. And so this angel, which in Hebrew the angel is just a messenger of God or a minister of God, is going to be offering the prayers of the saints as a sweet aroma on the golden altar altar of incense before God's throne. I believe that this angel is not just an angel, but is, is the same sort as the angel of the Lord. Jesus standing there ministering. You never see an angel acting like a high priest. It's, you know, that would be the position of Christ. And so he's going to take this incense, the prayers, and he's going to offer them before the Lord. Once again, it's that picture of working in union with Christ. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the incense burner and he filled it with fire from that altar. 
and he hurled it onto the earth. So the fire is always that picture of purifying, of purity. And so it's added to the incense and the prayers that's in that golden bowl taken from the altar before the Lord. And what is he purifying? Well, he purifies our prayers. If there's anything amiss in our prayers, it certainly is purified when the fire of God touches it. Anything that's unholy or fleshly or whatever gets gone. And its effect is going to be purifying because here the Lord takes it and he hurls the contents of that incense center, center, uh, sensor onto the earth. And what does it release? Incredible power, rumblings of thunder, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. If, if you go on to read the section of the trumpets, you'll see great displays of God's power will come to earth as a result of the censer being thrown down on the earth. The Lord's work will be made manifest and it will purify those who are on earth. As if, if they will bow, if they will submit to what the Lord is doing. It will either purify them or burn them up like uh, Nadab and Abihu who offered unholy fire before the Lord. And they were incinerated because of his holiness. So it will either purify them or burn them up one way or the other. But I think the thing to recognize is that as being a son or daughter of God, you now are participating, ministering before the Lord, and the prayers that we offer do something. They aren't just because. They actually affect things here on earth. The Lord gathers them up and at the right time offers them and then they become activated by his holy fire and they are cast down on the earth again and they interact in the dimension that we call reality. And the things that we see, the things that we experience, we sometimes we experience them as shakings of the heavens and the earth. Things falling apart. But it's really a display of God's power and might before us so that we will honor him and fear him as God. And we will come into a relationship with him as opposed to thinking we can do stuff on our own outside of God. God is God and we are not. If we would only learn that. So, <clears throat> this idea of waiting where there's just sort of the quiet. There's the awe of heaven at the end when the seventh seal is open. Seven is that picture of completion. When all is done, that quiet. That's a, that's a theme throughout all of Scripture. Noah, he built the ark. He labored and labored and labored, being obedient before the Lord. Built the ark, and then he was told to get in the ark after the animals had been collected, the food had been collected, everything's ready. He was told, go in the ark. And God shut the door and then he rested. In that case, the full seven days, he rested. It was a time of quietness and rest before the Lord. And then came the destruction on all of mankind. In, in the battle of Jericho, we sort of see it. A cycle, another cycle of seven. They walked, and then the next day they walked, and then they walked, and they walked until they got to the last day, and they walked around seven times. The people must have been thinking that he, they were crazy. Jericho, uh, the Jericho natives. What, what are you doing walking around, walking around? You know what happens to the earth people when they observe the heavenly people walking through the cycle of God. If they laugh, maybe they're a little afraid to begin with, but then when nothing happens, they laugh and they joke and they, they ignore. 
They might hurl insults or whatever until the destruction comes. And this is sort of the cycle of, of God's people because we walk by faith, not seeing that what we're doing is effectual. And maybe we're just in that moment of silence where all has been done and we're just waiting for God to act. So don't grow weary in doing good. But instead, wait, stay the course, knowing that the victory is sure. Because it will lead to a new cycle. And the eighth angel, who begins a new beginning. And I think that is the end of the seals. It leaves us in the place of being sons and daughters of God. Um, <clears throat> just this is really quick as as Leanne was sharing regarding um, I, I didn't expect to say anything I just figured Leanne would say something but um, she was sharing about the challenges we have on this earth and how we can overcome them and there's two passages that the Lord shared with me said you need to speak on these two things go to John 16 um, John 16 verse 33 very last verse before the high priestly prayer he says this He says, I have told you these things, all these things, I have to go to Jerusalem, get crucified, etc. So that in me, you may have peace. Colossians 3.3, it says that your life is hid with Christ in God. If this is the Feast of Tabernacles, and everything that Leanne was saying about um, that we have no need of a shelter for God is our shelter. Is this not Psalm 91? The Lord is our refuge. Jesus is our refuge. In me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. I had a moment earlier this week where I said, you know, I just, I just want to be able to <coughs> go to work, just not be bothered, day in, day out, do my thing, and then it hit me. No, that's wrong. Like to have a life free of struggle. Jesus said, I promise you one thing, you will have struggle. That's what Revelation was shared. You will have struggle. You will have the trials. But there's a greater promise. You also have me. And I'm over the world. I'm, o I, I'm over it. And go to Psalm 111. And I'll start it with verse 1. Psalm 111. Hallelujah. I will praise the Lord with all my heart in the assembly of the upright in the and in the congregation. The Lord's works are great, studied by all who delight in them. So, the sons and daughters of God, those who have gone through the seal training, we have all these people in history. They, del they see what the Lord has done, and they delight in that work. They have studied it, they have reviewed it, they take it to heart. All that He does, verse 3, is splendid and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. The Lord showed me this. He has caused His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. And the devil has been doing his best to cause God's work to be forgotten. When Leanne and I first got married, we started reading different 
people of faith. And we came across George Mueller, who took care of England's orphans during the 1800s on prayer and faith alone, and, and his work is still going on. He started the orphanage so that he said that he wanted to be a living testimony of God's faithfulness through the orphanage and taking care of the orphans. And when we read it, we said, Lord, do in me what you've done with that man, George Mueller. Lord Jesus, we want to be living testimonies of your faithfulness, that you are still faithful. Seventeen years for me, six, almost sixteen years as a married couple, I can say with confidence he's been faithful. And he's not done. He's just getting started. The seventh seal, that trying time, the tribulation time, we are the ones, those who've, who've thrown ourselves upon the Lord, are the ones who look back and say, He's been faithful. He's been faithful. He's been faithful. Almost like a broken record, He's been faithful. But each, He has caused every work in us for what purpose? For our sake? No, for His. So that He's remembered. So that He's remembered. And God forgive, for, forbid that we ever forget who he is we are seeing and, and I was so tempted oh God okay now what so revival happened on our property things were great and it seems like it seems like on the earth side on the fleshly side we don't live by sight but by faith on the fleshly side great loud bang lot of noise that's what it seems and the Lord's reminding me, you're just getting started. You're just breaking, and it's not me, it's, it's His work, breaking up the ground. Why? So that He would be caused to be remembered. Those works that happen. Preaching of the full gospel. Preaching that Jesus is Lord. That's where it starts. Is that not what Jesus says, that upon this rock, this foundation, that Jesus is Lord? That's where he built his church. Folks, he's built his church in a little plot of farmland. And in many others, and we're not the only ones, you know, in others who proclaim him as Lord. Not just Savior, but Lord, Master over all. Coming through the seven seals, that, that whole idea of being the, the, the sifting, and now that the prayers offered are effectual. I mean, they're, they're all effectual, but now you have the heart of God. Now you're understanding. You're, you're in a deeper intimacy. Now you can proclaim that lordship. Jesus says, now you can know that you have struggles here, but know that, it's, that whatever it is, I've overcome it. That your life and death here on this earth is of no account. Your pain and suffering and struggle is, yes, the Lord sees it, but it's nothing. It's minuscule. It's a, it's a drop in the bucket in comparison to the glory that you'll see for having suffered. Because of your decision, your choice to make Jesus Lord of all. And God in the great assembly, Psalm 111, has chosen his works to be remembered. It's through you as a living stone. It's through me. It's through the kids. It's through whoever. To make his work remembered. The name of the righteous will live. The name of the wicked will rot. If it's true, it will shine. But if it's, if it's a lie, it will rot. Reinhard Bonnke said that. And we see the the memory of the righteous is a blessing. This is for eternity. Your life does count for something. God is working in you. A tribulation, a challenge, but it's for His glory so that it will be remembered. You don't have to write a book. Your book's already written. You don't have to produce anything. It's already done. Because it's done in the work of Christ. 
on that cross. It's, that's his book. And you get a part in it. You get a page in the book of life. Your names are written there. So no matter if you're going through a struggle, yes, we have, we have times we want to be com- comfortable. God forbid that happen. Because then that means we are making it so that God's mighty works won't be remembered. But that the flesh would work. God forbid. God forbid we allow that to happen. Let us make His work known. Let us fully surrender. Every day. Like John Piper says, preach the truths of the gospel to your mind, to your heart, until you can... Uh, until you can grab a hold of it and come out of that closet and sing with confidence. Guys, we've got to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus rose again, blood for you and me. And you died on the cross with Christ and that He is Lord over all. If that's all you can say in the morning because you're so struggling and you can't make heads or tails and you can't seem to get out of bed, you can't seem to sing, you can't seem to do anything and all you can say is Jesus, thank you that you died for me and you rose again for me. If that's all you can say, then say that. Because that is the bedrock of your faith, that Jesus is Lord. You're Lord and I praise you. That's it. So, this call goes out to anybody who's hearing. If he's not Lord of your life, I invite you, say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I've been trying to live my life my way. Please forgive me. Come into my life, come into my heart, transform me. I receive your forgiveness. I'm sorry, please heal me, please change me. I want to live for you now forevermore. Show me how to do this. And I receive your baptism, Holy Spirit, to be part of that transformation process, to go from glory to glory. Thank you, Jesus, for your work. And I love you and I live for you. And thank you in Jesus' name. And if, if, if you have really believed that and have said that, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, friend, you're saved. He will work in you an amazing work of glory. Walk with Him. Trust Him. Call upon Him. He's right there. He's listening to you. He hears your cry. He counts every time you toss in your bed and you're anxious over money, anxious over your family, anxious over your husband or your wife. He hears it. He knows it. He knows you're crying in bed. He knows you're sad. He knows you can't be intimate with your spouse. He knows you can't talk to your kids. He knows that. Don't fight him. Talk to him. Pour out. Be transparent. That's what he wants. He really wants your heart. That's really what he wants. Father in heaven, whatever was said was said. And I thank you for the truth because the truth sets us free. 